Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Monday evening lecture series in critical and cultural theory. I see some familiar faces, but I know some people have been here before. Uh, I see also a lot of brand new faces, and I wonder, is there anyone for whom today is their very first day at Evergreen? Yes, okay, so welcome. Welcome to Evergreen, congratulations. And I will um, say just a little bit about the series, and then I will introduce my colleague who will introduce our speaker. My name is Greg Mullins, I'm Academic Dean of the Library, and I've been convening the series for, this is our sixth quarter, so we're finishing the second year. And this is a, a series of lectures that brings together a variety of academic programs. It's switched up every single quarter in terms of which programs, but this particular quarter we have reworking the subject, calculated fiction, and media culture advanced practices with other people who are here also, perhaps they're part of Media Works or perhaps they're here part of, the, of Reading with Alison Beck Bell, or they're on independent learning contracts. This is an open uh, lecture series, the public is open, feel free to bring your friends. But for some of the, for probably the majority of people in the room, you're here earning credit for what you're doing and the lectures here are connected to the work in your programs. Uh, the, the idea for the series came about because so often at Evergreen we're so intense in our uh, coordinated studies programs that we become isolated from each other. So this is an opportunity to branch out and work with people more broadly and also to, to share concepts uh, that are of wide interest to people in, in no matter what uh, sorts of studies they're doing in interdisciplinary studies. And with that, I will introduce my colleague, Julie Levin Russo, who teaches uh, media studies here at Evergreen. And Julie will take you through a, a little piece of housekeeping, which is how for you to register on our WordPress site. That's important because in those weeks when, when there's reading associated with the, um, with the evening lecture series, you'll have access to the readings only after you register for uh, on the site. So um, please uh, welcome Julie Levin Russo. Please, please. Um, so I will just very briefly show you the website, um, and then we'll get on to the business at hand. Um, the URL is sites.evergreen.edu slash cct. Um, that should also be on your Moodle or Canvas or Syllabus um, or wherever if you need the URL. Um, and hopefully, uh, there is a button here that says join the site that explains exactly how you do this. So if you click join the site, um, it gives you a very simple set of steps. Uh, the first one is create an account. So if you click that button, it's basically just going to ask you to log in with your Evergreen credentials. Um, so, okay, I'm going to log in. And so when you log in, it's going to just take you to the site's homepage. But if you look under my sites in the corner, there should be a link to CCT. That's the dashboard. Yours will not be the dashboard. Okay, so let's say I go back here and I'm going to refresh this now that I've logged in. Okay, so now it's getting rid of the register button. Um, because I'm already logged in. So now I'm in the site. Uh, and you can check if it's in there, if it's under my site. So it's like pretty self-explanatory. There's a join the site um, link if you need to go through the steps again. In the past, it's been pretty easy for people to do. Um, but it's just key that you remember to do it because if you don't join the site and then if you don't go to the site when you're logged in, you won't be able to access the protect protected feature. So that includes videos of the lectures which are on a protected page and certain readings you won't be able to download from these links if you're not logged in. Um, so that's pretty much um, orientation to the website. 
There's an overview on the home page, um, and there's a page with posts for readings for future weeks. Um, and that's the main important information you'll find there. Anything else to add? Okay. Um, so now I will go on to the more exciting business of introducing Pooja Rangan. Um, Pooja is an assistant professor of culture and media at Eugene Lang College at the New School, um, and she is soon to be assistant professor of film and media at Amherst College. She's moving. Um, I have had the privilege of knowing her for many years, and she has personally enriched my intellectual understanding um, of media and representation in many ways. Her work is at a very interesting intersection of film studies and media studies, um, along with more esoteric fields such as animal studies and ego criticism. Um, so it's not easily categorized um, or defined, and uh, it's pretty, I think, exciting and novel the way she brings together various fields um, into new intersections. Uh, she has worked on such things as animal elephant paintings, so paintings made by elephants, and other art and media representations created by animals and how we humans understand them, um, and such things as disaster studies um, and representations of, of weather and its human toll around Hurricane Katrina. Um, her upcoming book, Immediations, which is forthcoming from Duke University Press, examines the humanitarian impulse in documentary with a special focus on the discursive encounters between childhood, animality, ethnicity, and disability. Um, she has published on topics such as documentary, ethnographic media, postcoloniality, humanitarianism, and Indi Indian cinema in many journals and magazines. Um, and her work really challenges us to think in new ways about what even is a medium or a media form um, and what is representation um, and who are the subjects and objects of media representation. So please welcome Pooja. Thank you, Julie, for that lovely introduction. Um, Julie's a very old friend, and I feel as warmly toward her as she does toward me, and I've heard a lot from her about this really wonderful community that she's found here. So I'm thrilled to be here, and I want to thank her and her other colleagues for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, so I'm really excited to talk with you and for the conversation afterward. And just so you know what to expect, I'll talk for around 45 minutes, and this, sh this should leave us a good amount of time afterward for a discussion. And um, if anything I say is confusing, or if any of the references are unfamiliar, you should feel totally free to ask me for clarification afterward. And I'm also really eager to hear what you have to say to me and what you have to teach me, because um, as Julie mentioned, a lot of my work is very interdisciplinary and draws on many areas that you may know more about than I do. So um, please, please um, feel free to voice your, um, what you have to say in, in terms of either a question or a comment or um, any kind of way of phrasing your insights afterward are all welcome. So my talk is titled, Giving a Voice, Humanitarianism, Autism, Documentary. Um, the screen may kind of bleep out or jiggle. There's some issues with the power, so just try to ride them through. It it'll always come back. In September 2009, Autism Speaks, the world's largest autism research foundation, released a fundraising video that was roundly criticized for silencing the voices of autistic individuals. Directed by Alfonso Cuaron, himself the parent of an autistic child, the video fuses a characteristic trope of the horror film with a documentary realism of the home movie, 
to insist on the urgency of finding a cure for autism. In a succession of documentary-like scenes, a series of silent, anonymous, solitary children are revealed to be the unsuspecting victims of the protagonist, autism, whose acousmatic voice emanates menacingly from off screen. Autism, speaking in the first person, bears the trace of the Grierzonian voice of God. Its omniscient and omnipotent subjectivity seemingly flourishes by emptying out the life force of the autistic children, whose voiceless vacant faces shore up the video's message that autism is an impairment in communication requiring urgent therapeutic intervention. As the video unfolds, autism promises to divest the families of autistic children of their marital bliss, money, sleep, and hope. And with each, with each threat, the wholesome landscapes of childhood seen in the brief vignettes, playground, baseball fan, backyard, beach, fairground, school, all, of you, all assume the form of potential disease vectors while the innocent gestures of the children as they strum their hands across a table or stare into space begin to resemble the paranoid symptoms of an epidemic that renders them mute and alien. In the second half of the video, the crisis is abruptly averted. A chorus of voices representing the families of autistics commandeers the voiceover, promising to knock down the wall imprisoning the children by any means necessary. The scenes are played over but as family portraits. A new cast of characters, siblings, parents, extended families, and friends emerge from offstage to envelop the children in a communal embrace. The frozen faces of the children break into smiles as an uplifting guitar theme and the sounds of youthful laughter announce their release into sociality. So my talk today examines one of the central and guiding metaphors of the humanitarian media intervention. And this is the notion of having a voice, or as it's often stated in the humanitarian version, giving a voice. The voice has become a virtual battleground in media representations of autism, dating back to its emergence in 1943 as, an, as a diagnostic category. And this includes parent memoirs, fictional conversion narratives, autistic biographies, and Hollywood films. In this instance, Autism Speaks, which is an advocacy organization, proposes to give a voice to the voiceless, while autistic self-advocates have condemned its sensationalist and crude ventriloquism of their concerns and their neurological differences. Their critique is summed up in a t-shirt that one group produced, which reads, Autism speaks can go away. I have autism, I can speak for myself. So my paper examines how conventional uses of documentary for remedying this familiar representational predicament are problematized by the existential dilemmas of autistic speech or voicing. As a genre whose formal language has evolved in conjunction with the aim of social intervention, Documentary has forged a privileged kinship with a spoken voice. The realism of documentary is rhetorical rather than visual. It emphasizes urgent issues over and above illusionistic absorption. So this is how documentary is often distinguishes itself from fiction film. Um, its realism is that of telling you things, not of showing you things. The expository voiceover used to great effect in Autism Speaks is video is arguably one of the most effective tropes in documentary's rhetorical arsenal. 
given its way of forcefully rising above formal and aesthetic distractions to emphasize its message. And so it's not surprising that a number of recent documentary films have appropriated this trope, the first person voiceover, in order to enable autistic protagonists to quote, speak for themselves. Um, and the idea is that they can elevate the perspective of autistics above those of medical experts and humanitarian advocates who would otherwise want to speak on their behalf. These include films like Jam Jar from 1995, Autism is a World, which I'll speak about. Um, My Classic Life as an Artist, a Portrait of Lani Bissonnette is another, that's from 2005. So my goal is to question the self-evident forms of humanity or agency that are claimed for autistics when the voice in documentary is deployed for humanitarian ends. And I do this by approaching the first person documentary voiceover from the perspective of autistic accounts of language, speech, and communication. By placing these accounts in conversation with media theoretical debates regarding the voice, as well as canonical studies of documentary, I want to uncover an autistic counter theory of the voice that resides in the shadows of the documentary tropes of authoritative speech. And so with this alternative notion of voicing in mind, I'm going to look closely at two documentary video interventions that feature autistic voices. One of them is Autism is a World, a 2004 TV documentary by Geraldine Wurzberg, which can only be described as remedial insofar as it unreflexively employs the first person voiceover in order to insist on the agency or humanity of its protagonist, Sue Rubin, who's pictured here. Um, and in contrast, Amelia Baggs' 2007 short 2007 video, In My Language, um, I'll argue, illustrates a more radical approach to the autistic voice, and this is an approach that emerges through um, what I'll argue is a kind of feminist critique of the documentary form. And in the process, I'll argue that Baggs also brings a more capacious, uh, a more challenging, uh, but a more enabling vision of humanity into view than the one that we would um, get if we follow traditional humanitarian accounts of humanity. So before I continue, I want to take a few moments to give you some context about the larger project from which the stock is drawn and which Julie mentioned. The stock is a condensed version of the final chapter of a book I'm working on, which is titled Immediations, the Humanitarian Impulse in Documentary. Um, which will be published by Duke University Press. Um, Immediations uses participatory documentary to understand the stakes of humanitarian intervention. So in this book, I ask how the humanitarian emphasis on urgent immediate action, which you can think of in terms of human rights campaigns by organizations like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, how that kind of emphasis on urgent immediate action as opposed to a critical assessment of the politics of representation, actually compromises the beneficiaries of humanitarian documentary projects rather than empowering them, as projects like these claim. And I look at a variety of participatory initiatives in which marginalized subjects are provided with visual media as a means of immediate self-empowerment. Um, and I look at photography workshops, among the children of sex workers in the film Born into Brothels, for instance, to amateur eyewitness reporting by Katrina survivors, um, as well as the rehabilitation of endangered Asian draft elephants as painters, and documentary attempts to cultivate an autistic voice, which I'm going to speak about today. Um, so Mediations argues that the humanitarian ethic of immediacy shapes a repertoire of um, humanist tropes of immediacy across documentary media, and these include uh, the photographic aesthetic of innocence that children often have to demonstrate in order to receive aid, the self-portrait as a way of transparently, transparently evidencing interiority or humanity or um, a kind of legitimating a des uh, being deserving of empathy, um, as well as the televisual language of liveness and urgency that is expected of eyewitnesses to disaster. 
So human rights advocates often position these kinds of tropes of immediacy or immediations, as I want to call them, as a timely human, hum, humanizing prosthesis that evidences the endangered humanity of disenfranchised subjects. But when they do this, I argue, they actually end up reinforcing the marginality and otherness of their beneficiaries. And so the book challenges the anti-aesthetic ethic of documentary, arguing that in our postmodern globalized era, the aesthetics and politics of representation are as important as the urgent task of saving lives. So at a broader level, I want to articulate a radical minoritarian approach to documentary theory and practice that actually enables an alternative vision of the human and which undermines the neoliberal, neoliberal discourse of media empowerment. And this is along the lines of work being done by some feminist and post-colonial media scholars that you might have encountered in your classes, like Ray Chow, Thomas Keenan, and Laura U. Marks. So my work develops a critique of, as well as a counter history of the humanitarian impulse in documentary. So to come back to today's topic, the first person voiceover is one such documentary trope whose self-evident humanity or agency is troubled by the autistic recipients of media empowerment. And this is a trope that you'll encounter in much of the documentary media that you'll watch. So the next time you're at a documentary festival or a film festival, just keep your eye out for the sheer number of works that are first person works. So that's the kind of um, work that I'm trying to raise questions about today. So to begin, it's necessary to situate documentary's investments in speech as an immediate authoritative measure of humanity in the context of its historical activist vocation. In 1942, one of the earliest theorist practitioners of documentary, John Grierson, influentially located the genre's specificity in what he called its anti-aesthetic imperative. So according to Grierson, documentary's goal was to present the urgent social problems of the time in a very direct, immediate, and even didactic fashion, which brushed aside efforts to contemplate form or aesthetic value. So this is how he was distinguishing documentary from, say, Hollywood film which is all about being absorbed in illusion and thinking about form and style. So in other words, documentary was conceived from the beginning as a mode of humanitarian media intervention, insofar as aesthetic considerations were to be subordinated to its social message. Now, Grierson's favored idiom, the expository voiceover, elevated the speaking voice in documentary's formal architecture in order to achieve that goal. Um, now, the stroke consisted, as you might know, of an idealized male voice describing what you would see from off screen in a third person. And the emanation of this voice from an unknowable other scene, as well as its masterful location above the diegetic sounds and images, worked in concert with its social as well as its rhetorical coding um, to reinforce its kind of otherworldly or metaphysical status. And this earned it the informal moniker of voice of God narration. This is an instance of what the film scholar Michel Chion calls an acousmatic voice. Um, and what I mean is that it forcefully draws attention away from its source, you don't, which you don't see. Um, away from the materiality and embodiment of its source and instead directs attention to its message. Um, and as a case in point, you can think of the use of this mode of narration in that short video that I showed, the I am autism video, which forcefully delivers the message that autism is an emergency requiring action and not contemplation. And it uses the first person pronoun to further obscure the discursive origins of the message, which you're not really encouraged to think about. Um, it's just there, it informs. So formally, the expository voiceover exemplifies the anti-aesthetic ethic of documentary. So there's a kind of paradox here. Even though it's added, like a supplement, the voiceover, when it's operating in this way, actually subtracts or negates the meanings that lie beneath it in the audiovisual hierarchy. Its interpretive authority derives both from its technical place 
in the audiovisual hierarchy, but also from our own attunement, which is a really ideological attunement to the speaking voice as a measure of humanity. Um, the efficacy of such a voice, which anchors the play of meanings in, in any text, it actually lies in its denotative clarity. So you can see why the first person voiceover has become a very appealing trope um, for recent um, advocacy films like the ones that I mentioned earlier, which are seeking to authorize the agency and the humanity of autistic protagonists. This trope enables disabled subjects to exert as much authorial control as possible over the message of the film, short of producing it themselves. As the primary filter through which all other perspectives are mediated, the first person voiceover combines the interpretive authority of expository narration with the kind of immediacy of face-to-face -face conversation. Its humanization of the voice of God convention actually lends it credibility or believability. Um, and what's more, the stroke overcomes the protagonist's difficulties with spoken communication, which I'll say a little bit more about, by translating their autobiographical writings into a very naturalistic audiovisual idiom. It asserts the speaker's authority to speak about her interior world, by which I mean the subjective experiences, practical challenges, and the perceptual world of living with autism. Now the gesture of appropriating the voiceover for authenticating um, the subjectivity of a typically objectified subject. So in other words, someone who would normally be speaking about, spoken about is allowed to speak for themselves, such as the autistic. Uh, what it does is it, is it actually rehearses a very familiar evolutionary narrative about the way documentary has been democratized as a form. Um, some of you might have encountered the work of Bill Nichols, who's a very influential voice in the field. And he has this account of the evolving modes of documentary, which is perhaps the most influential version of this kind of narrative of progress of our documentary. Um, in his now classic study, Nichols narrates the history of documentary as um, a story of the democratization of the right to speak. Uh, in which the Grierzonian voice of God is gradually appropriated and superseded by the voices of minoritarian social actors in various forms like the conversation, the interview, the voiceover, commentary. So the idea is exposition gives way to participation and in more and more documentaries we see the voiceless beginning to speak for themselves. The question I want to ask is, what exactly is at stake in reconciling the voice of autistics with the denotative clarity and authority of the first person voiceover. So my answer requires first a detour through a debate regarding the voice that might not appear at first glance to be about documentary. Um, but I want to suggest that on closer examination, it actually very richly illuminates the unspoken assumptions embedded in that kind of Grierzonian voice of God as well as the liberatory narrative regarding documentary speech that's set in motion when that kind of voice is used to authorize um, typically voiceless subjects. The metaphor of having a voice that drives discourses of social justice, including documentary, turns on the importance of speech for participating in any political process. Speaking out is commonly understood as a liberatory act of giving expression to an interior idea or a thought or an opinion or wish um, that actually begins the subject's entrance into the political sphere, um, which announces the subject's humanity. And the belief that humanity abides in this capacity for externalizing something inner through speech is actually a very old idea in Western philosophy that dates back to Plato and Aristotle. Um, animals, Aristotle famously proclaimed, don't have a voice even though they produce sounds. He believed that voice is only a sound with a meaning. So according to this narrative, the voice or the capacity to produce physical sounds only exists to make meaning, and that's specifically linguistic meaning. This is what is believed to set humans apart from other animals. 
and the meaning in question is thought to already reside inside the body in the form of what's known as logos or inner speech, reason, um, the human bequest of the voice or word of God. The voice is just the vehicle by which it can be evidenced. The metaphysical imperative of man rising above matter to achieve his true inner substance, reason, um, it actually weighs upon the voice in a particular way in this Western philosophical tradition. Um, by which I mean that privileging the linguistic content of speech over its social embodied modes of meaning making, the voice is actually treated as a vanishing mediator in this Western tradition. To quote the philosopher and media scholar Mladen Dolar, the voice makes the utterance possible, but it disappears in it. It goes up in smoke in the meaning being produced so that we only concentrate on the meaning that's being conveyed and not on the material or physical attributes of the voice itself. In addition to revealing the metaphysical um, inheritance of the Grierzonian voice of God, Dolar's insight also points to the complications that having a voice presents for speakers whose communications bear embodied marks of difference um, in an audible way, whether that's race or sex or ability. Um, the imperative of evacuating speech of its corporeality presents a unique burden for autistics whose neurological conditions can involve a range of non-normative verbal competencies and inclinations. Some autistics are highly talkative and articulate. Others experience language delay, lose their verbal faculties later in life, or struggle with echolalia. That is the obsessive urge to repeat certain words and phrases. Many nonverbal or minimally verbal autistics communicate through voice to text and other assistive technologies, including facilitated communication. Um, and this is a technique in which a facilitator guides your hand to letters or icons on a keyboard and reads the words or sentences aloud when you can't. When describing their difficulties of voicing, autistic commentators often mention the incongruity of their neurobiology with spoken language, which relies heavily on the faculty of abstraction. Autism makes it difficult to interpret, prioritize, hierarchize, and integrate sensory information so as to abstract the body from the environment. And what this means is that subjects and objects, faces and backgrounds, voices and sounds can exist on the same undifferentiated plane as a fluid tapestry of patterns and motions. So this might mean that you and the chair would be equally perceptible or significant as sensory phenomena. Um, the autistic writer and activist Amelia Baggs explains her struggle with the abstract categories of language, and she writes, this is a quote from her, I don't have many buffers. To me, the world comes in such great detail that it's hard for me to put the easy interpretations on it that most people use. The way they divide it into pieces and make it abstract is foreign to me. Similarly, Titu Rajarshi Mukhopadhyay, who is an autistic writer and poet who relies on facilitated communication, he describes speech as a dissociative process of trying to corral a body that's reluctant to being zoned as faculties or organs. And he writes that autism made him feel that his voice was a distant substance that was required to be collected and put somewhere in his throat. Like Mukhopadhyay, DJ Savarese, who's another autistic writer, um, says that he needs the calming presence of a facilitator in order to focus his body movements, his muscles, on the act of typing, without which his body flaps and sways uncontrollably in response to the overwhelming sensory detail, which pulls him in many directions at once. Um, for primatologist Don Prince, Spoken words operate less as containers of stable meanings than as an elastic sensory horizon for reshaping the world. She recounts how her obsessive repetition of the word hippopotamus 
would bring familiarity and order to overwhelming sensory situations by allowing her to focus on its reassuring associations, like the warm sensation of running bath water. The voice, deployed in this way, experiences language less as an intersubjective medium, that is, less as something for two people to talk to each other, and more as a kind of milieu that, categor that catalyzes a merger with the environment, joining humans to other species and even to insentient objects. And in fact, Prince attributes her communion with animals and plants to this ability. But from a humanitarian perspective, the abundant excesses of having a voice in the autistic sense can only be interpreted as a lack or a deficit in communication. The absence of articulate speech is interpreted as a breach of humanity, one that requires immediate therapeutic intervention. And if you look around, you'll find that such thinking motivates the vast majority of contemporary treatments for autism spectrum disorders, from speech and language and occupational therapy, to sensory integration, to early language intervention. All of these and various combinations aim to cultivate a kind of comportment or orientation toward human vo voices, faces, and language, and to kind of corral and channel the cognitive, physiological, and affective supports of making vocal sounds into producing and shaping words. At the far extreme of the humanitarian spectrum, we find an organization like Autism Speaks. And if you think back to that video that I showed you, the horror of the I Am Autism video turns on the self-evidently positive value of the speaking voice as a marker of humanity, interiority, or political subjectivity. The autistic children are depicted as being trapped in a world of their own without a portal to express their interiority. And the video's solution, which is of, of providing them with a vocal delegate speaking on their behalf shows how the documentary intervention of giving a voice participates in this humanitarian medicalization of autism as a disorder. But what would it mean to disarticulate the voice from the goal of linguistic meaning? So this is the question that's posed by Amelia Bags. Bags writes, and I'm gonna project a quote from her, not everyone has words, but everyone has a voice and a mean of means of communicating. And not everyone who uses words sees words as their primary voice or as their primary means of understanding things. Most people seem to miss these facts and automatically see having a voice as the same as using speech, or at least using language. Bax's statement is actually deceptively simple. On the surface, it seems to participate in a very recognizable human rights discourse, which aims to um, claim the humanity of autistics or include various excluded subjects on the basis that they also have a voice. But if we look at it more carefully, we find that Bax stages a very sophisticated critique of the confining form of humanity that human rights advocates and humanitarian agents believe that they're liberating when they give autistics a voice. Bax's insistence that autistics who cannot speak already have a voice suggests that what's given in such interventions is not a voice per se, but instead an attunement to the humanitarian and by extension the documentary tropes of articulate persuasive speech. But she's saying maybe that's not a voice. Maybe a voice actually exists somewhere outside that definition. In other words, Bags asks us to contemplate what might happen if the communicative comportment, the desire to communicate, were released from the primary obligation of producing words or linguistic sounds for a human audience. She hints that we can grasp an alternative autistic concept of voice if we approach it from the perspective of those who are thought not to have a voice in the first place. So she's issuing a conceptual challenge in that sentence that I showed you. 
What if a voice is precisely what it seems not to be? What modes of experience and meaning would such a sonic relation facilitate? How would engaging with such a non-voice transform the humanitarian norms of humanity? So with Bax's critique in mind, we're able to see the impoverishment not only of the humanity and interiority that we tend to associate with having or giving a voice in the humanist sense, but also of audiovisual forms whose main goal is immediately conveying this interiority through spoken voices, for example, documentary. Autistic interlocutors like Bags, Mukhopadhyay, and Prince are offering nothing less than an autistic counter theory of the voice as a communicative comportment that suspends the subject in an unhierarchized engagement with the world that has not yet been preformed and shaped by language. So the autistic voice calls up the phenomenally, con phenomenally contradictory experiences of sound and vision that are both operative in the act of speech, one of which immerses in the subject in a field of resonance and the other of which abstracts her from it. It refers to the entanglement with the world as an incipient ecology of relations encompassing human, non-human, and inhuman registers, to borrow a phrase from the Deleuzian scholar Aaron Manning. When we approach them in this light, media theorists like Mladen Dolar and Roland Barthes confirm for us that the autistic voice is in fact not exclusive to autistics, but it's a spectral presence in all of our communication. Bart refers, for instance, to the grain of the voice, an erotic, pre-logical aspect of communication that is beyond its coded, sanctioned forms of embodiment and signification. Such grainness inheres, according to Bart, in the space of an encounter between a language and a voice, one that suspends the foreclosure of meaning. Similarly, the autistic voice may reside in the fleeting new relational potentials that are awakened by language before the voice is differentiated and localized as a speech event that culminates in words or linguistic meaning. And you can think here of Mukhopadhyay's account of having to collect and put his voice in his throat, which is a kind of vivid reminder of that kind of awakening which hasn't yet been given a shape. Paradoxically, this suggests that autistics have a voice precisely when they fail to communicate, such as, for instance, when they're accused of being in a world of their own or avoiding eye contact or engaging in nonsensical, obsessive, or repetitive speech. In the remainder of my talk, I want to consider what it means to realize an autistic notion of the voice in documentary. And I'm going to do this through a close reading of two films that are diametrically opposed in their prognoses of what it means to enable autistics to speak for themselves using the first person voiceover. In Geraldine Wurzberg's Oscar-nominated TV documentary for CNN, Autism is a World, the protagonist Sue Rubin's autobiographical commentary um, serves as a kind of anchor through which we encounter the so-called neurotypical perspectives of her doctors, support staff, and family members. Documentary scholars often view first-person narration as a reflexive technique of subverting sober exposition through a performative exploration of subjectivity. But when the first person voice is deployed for humanitarian ends, as it is by Wurzberg in this film, it assumes an expository tenor that strips it of its grain. Far from enabling Rubin to speak for herself, the first person voiceover dissociates Rubin from her abjected autistic body whose impairments she regards from on high. Uh, now contrast this with Amelia Bax's video, In My Language, which illustrates the incongruity between autistic voicing and the immediacy of the first person expository voice. Bax aligns her counter theory of the voice with the aesthetic noise 
that the documentary tropes of immediacy negate in the name of humanity. Autism is a world chronicles Sue Rubin's self-described transformation, thanks to facilitated communication, or FC, from being an autistic non-person, in her words, to a successful college student living in an assisted living facility, an involved participant in decisions regarding her life, and a frequent speaker at conferences for and about those on the autistic spectrum. In addition to serving as the thematic preoccupation of Boisberg's film, Sue Rubin's reliance on FC also sets up its formal problematic. Show you a clip from the film. This visibly mediated and laborious form of communication, in which Rubin picks out individual letters on a keyboard, which are then read aloud by a support staff member, with frequent interruption by Rubin's echolalic episodes, means that her comments are never delivered spontaneously in her own voice. Thus, the indirect mode of address of FC is antagonistic not only to the discursive immediacy of documentary tropes like the interview and the observed conversation, which, in which you almost are in a direct conversation or a face-to-face -face conversation with whoever is speaking with you, but it's also antagonistic to the strictly regulated length of the TV documentary. It's just too inconvenient to show in full length. Wurzburg finds a solution to the dilemma of enabling Rubin to speak for herself in the first person voiceover, which features autobiographical commentary composed by Rubin, delivered in emotional tones by the actress Juliana Margulies. Are there any good wife fans in the audience? <laughs> um, the voiceover coheres the film together by resolving the incoherence of Rubin's own communiques. As the film opens over Rubin's face framed in the doorway to her home, this prosthetic voice invites us inside. My name is Sue Rubin. I'm 26 years old. I have written these thoughts about my life because I don't really talk. This is not my voice, but these are my words. The association of the voiceover with the content of Rubin's innermost thoughts subsequently authorizes its perpetual editorial intervention in the time-consuming sequences featuring <coughs> Rubin's use of facilitated communication, which are always presented in a truncated and heavily edited form. Margulies's voice frequently fills in the response time by Rubin's struggles to type a sentence to tell us what she's really thinking. Autism is a world so difficult to explain to someone who is not autistic. Someone who can easily turn off the peculiar movements and actions that take over our bodies. The stakes of the interiority with which the voiceover endows Rubin come into focus perhaps most fully during the scenes in which Rubin is shown zoning out by watching water run through a faucet or drizzling water over the spoons that she carries about with her as an inexplicable source of comfort. Autism is not a social way of life. Many times solitude is one's best friend. Other times it can be my own worst enemy. Spinning me into an autistic Here, the relationship between the Rubin we hear, speaking in Margulies' soft, mellifluous voice, 
And the Rupin we see struggling with autism is not unlike the relationship between the voice of autism and the faces of autistic children in the I Am Autism video. Here too, the voiceover hovers over, observing Rubin's body in the manner of an object, providing dispassionate commentary about her awful autism. The status of voice can only comfortably be claimed by Margulies' unbroken, perfectly intoned speech as the ideal, successful form of Rubin's communicative potential. It never seems appropriate to the incoherent sounds and movements that pitch forth from Rubin's on-screen body. Indeed, the times that she zones out or when her attention drifts during FC never remain on screen long enough to become communicative events in their own right. These halting, non-verbal utterances are cast as the primitive precursors of proper speech that must be observed, described, and overcome. In the narrative economy of the film, the coevalness or contemporaneity of autistic voicing must be denied in order to arrive at the interiority to which the first person voiceover promises us direct and intimate access. I'm going to show a clip now from Amelia Bags's short film, In My Language. The film itself is only seven minutes long, and you're going to see a good chunk of it. in my language, clarifies that the autistic voice is a casualty rather than a referent of the first person voiceover in the humanitarian mode. This eight minute long video, which Bags posted to YouTube in 2007, recalls the work of the feminist experimental filmmaker and scholar Trinti Minha in its elegant deconstruction of the documentary tropes of humanitarian intervention. As many of you may know, Trin is well known for her critique of the totalizing language of ethnographic cinema, uh, particularly expository narration or voiceover commentary, for its way of disguising the filmmaker's subjective perspective as objective information about non-Western cultures. Bags extends this critique to the first person voiceover as the liberalized guise in which the so-called voiceless are turned into native informants speaking authoritatively about their condition, but this time for a humanitarian audience. The illustrative sounds and images that serve mainly as rhetorical support in a film like Wurzburg's are the main event in the first half of Bags's video, which consists entirely of a number of encounters resembling the transitory scenes where Rubin is shown zoning out. Rather than providing explanatory commentary, Bags suspends us in the space and time of these potential communications. These scenes show Bags interacting with a series of everyday objects in ways that don't correspond to their proper uses. She strums her fingers across a computer keyboard, bats and flicks at a beaded necklace, smells and rubs her face against a book, strokes the ridges of a griddle pan, flutters a receipt in the wind, waves and wags her fingers before the camera, and vigorously fondles the knob of a drawer. The camera in her hands becomes a haptic, sonic eye, to borrow Laura U. Marx's description of this feminist video technique. Rather than scrutinizing the object in any scene with a controlling, penetrating gaze, she grazes the surface of the materials with which she interacts, becoming immersed in textures, sounds, and movements rather than abstracting herself from her environment. The human face, or its stand-in, the voice, 
don't organize our relationship to what we see as they do in autism as a world. In the second half of the video, titled Translation, these scenes are repeated with voiceover commentary by Bags, in which she describes them as expressions of her, quote, native language. However, this commentary doesn't humanize Bags in the conservative sense, as Margulies' prosthetic voice does for Rubin, by conjuring the fantasy of an able, normatively gendered body. Instead, the affectless electronic modal tone of augmented speech through which Bax's typed commentary is filtered deflects the attempt to read it as a window onto her innermost self or to scan it for signs of personality. Even as this suggestive label, translation, assures an interpretive key to Bax's so-called native language, the scenes that play alongside her commentary retain a beguiling opacity. In one of the rare instances in which Bags synchronizes her explanation to an action, the content of her voiceover refuses the explanatory charge conventionally assigned to the spoken word in documentary, as well as the interpretive finality that we typically associate with the loc location of verbal commentary above other audiovisual expressions. I'm going to play a clip here. I laugh with, it was not about designing words or even visual symbols for people to interpret. It is about being in a constant conversation with every aspect of my environment. See nothing physically to all parts of my surroundings. In this part of the video, the water doesn't symbolize anything. I am just interacting with the water as the water interacts with me. Far from being purposes. The way that I move is in a going response to what is around me, ironically. The way that I move when responding to everything around me is described as being in a world of my own. Whereas if I interact with a much more elemented set of responses, I only react to a much more elemented part of my surroundings. People claim that I am opening up to true interaction with the world. Was there anyone who couldn't hear or see the subtitles? Just raise your hand if you couldn't. Good. Bax's inversion of the tropes of hu humanitarian immediacy revealed a folly of imagining that liberation lies in speaking for oneself. At best, she seems to be saying, a voice can speak near oneself to invoke another of Trinity Minha's famous phrases, the notion of speaking nearby rather than speaking for. Indeed, the very notion of selfhood, as the first person pronoun abstracts it, is the object of Bax's radical critique. The mismatch of form and content between the direct address and immediacy of her commentary and its insistence on the poverty of its verbal translation of her voice powerfully reveals the paradox of having a voice. From a humanitarian perspective, the autistic dwelling in an infinite field of perceptual and relational possibilities is seen as disabled or trapped. But in an inversion of that logic, Bax proposes that those who respond to the humanitarian call in a recognizable tongue, those are the ones who are in fact confined to an impoverished conception of humanity. Her choice of the first person voiceover as the vehicle of such a critique invites us to leave behind the discursive closet of a voice and its trappings of interiority, joining her elsewhere in the liberating modes of meaning and relationality that it excludes. Bax thus brings a more capacious, autistic notion of humanity into view by approaching documentary aesthetics as integral rather than incidental to its politics. Her approach is emblematic of the ways in which this talk, as well as my research as a whole, brings a minoritarian critique of documentary to bear on the theory and practice of humanitarian media intervention. Thank you for listening.
I'm not sure how much time we have set aside for a conversation. It's 6.36. We have about 25 minutes, so any thoughts or questions or comments that you have are absolutely welcome. Yeah. So much. Can I um, can I ask a, can I ask you a question? Sure. What can you can you talk to us a little bit about the concepts that you mentioned that your daughter was coming up with? Well, one of the things that she's recently started saying is, "I'm weird and that's cool." <laughs> um, for a very long time, because she is um, conventionally attractive, uh, she is uh, verbal, highly verbal, and uh, she does have echolalia, but it's uh, it's not as bad as, as for instance, you see in some of the videos. She's kind of been limited uh, in, in what people perceive of her having a disability or having a neuro, uh, neurotransmitter problem. Uh, so she, she has kind of had this um, space, I guess, to, to develop a lot of these concepts. One of the biggest ones is that she started saying, um, I choose to do these things uh, communication-wise. You know, for instance, she draws instead of uh, speaks a lot of times. Uh, uh, and, and she started realizing that that can be just an effective means of communication. Um, she has started focusing on very um, deep feminist concepts that I, you know, I, I have to kind of you know read up on, um, you know. But but she she has really uh, been generous in, in her education. I mean, we kind of have a little patois. You know, once you get to a certain point, you realize that there's not really going to be my language. for sharing that. Um, I really appreciate it. And yeah, I think that that's one of the things that I hope was coming out through this talk was that it, we, the only hope that we have for articulating some kind of an exchange is precisely through an exchange. We, we have to work with language, right? We have to work with these frames of representation that are available to us in order to get somewhere else. And it sounds like that's what your daughter is trying to do through this exchange with you and with everyone else as well. So thank you so much. In the back over there. Um, I, um, I just want to say thank you so much for this because I am actually an autistic person myself. This is what we need as a community. Um, we do not need more autism speaks. Essentially, autism speaks because parents are afraid that they can get the kid they want. Um, that away it can make lives for Farley me and many others so much easier. Thank you for saying that. Um, something that I always struggle with when doing when what when I'm, that I've been struggling with with this project is trying to understand um, how 
this, how what we want to create as a kind of progressive political intervention can translate in a practical way. So I was wondering if you have anything that you would like to say in terms of, um, I think that this, this has very different implications for nonverbal and verbal autistics. So I was wondering if you, you might want to say anything in regard to that. speech therapist and see if we can get it, get him talking. Um, in a way, that was a blessing. At the same time, though, I wonder if I was born 10 years later, I, I could have gotten a different form of education. Um, I do think there is kind of a bless. I do think in some ways that old mate might help more, because I remember Sipple Grandin, um, the almighty of autism right now, um, has stated that she also was hammered hard into her training to get to a better state, which she appreciates. There are others that very much want their own community of acceptance and want the community around them to mold better so they can better fit. I think I think there needs to be a level of compromise on all levels in order to better, because all the, there's never 100% change, it's always compromise. And it seems also just particularly complicated by the fact that autism is so singular and that there's no single experience of this condition. It's completely variegated along a spectrum, right? You could, it's definitely next to the, um, like the gentleman's daughter there, and there are things we'll probably, get, probably see my eye on, and there's aspects that we would never can, can emulate. And yeah. I've never been one to, I never had problems with sensory of water falling on me. I've heard others that can, it's hell. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? <coughs> yeah. Well, I also, like, growing up with an autistic older brother, thank you so much for this talk because it really sort of made me think of all the little things that my brother did growing up, and he grew up, uh, grew up in a similar situation that we did. He was born in 1989 before what they really knew what autism was, and it was kind of scary. <coughs> And like growing up with an autistic brother, you just sort of, you, you get used to all the sort of little things that he does and like all the shaking and the energy and uh, the voices and stories and things like that, but just sort of to view it in a way where it's a communication, but it's a nonverbal communication. The question I had though was, why did you uh, choose autism as an application for your book and as a sort of like a crossroads or an example between humanitarianism and documentary and voice? Um, that is an excellent question. Um, part, partly I did just because of the rich kind of way in which the notion of the, the figure of the autistic became a vessel in many of the accounts I was reading for what is actually a very loosely thrown around metaphor in humanitarian discourse, which is the notion of giving a voice. And you're right that I could have thought, I could have turned to something such as deaf studies um, to make a similar kind of intervention. But I think it's partly because of um, the very rich ways in which the senses are not, it's not that one of the senses is absent and therefore a kind of claim can be made about a different way of orientation, but rather they're all active in a different configuration, which raises for me questions about the different kinds of political implications of a way of understanding the world, which cannot be reduced to one reason, right? Like if you, if you don't have vision, therefore you can you can exist in the world in this way, but the sheer complexity of this condition raised these questions for me in a way that I found helpfully complex and very difficult to reduce in a way that I felt that could be kind of enabling for a progressive politics, if that makes sense.
Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? Um, and I want to just say that everyone should feel free to speak up, even if you don't have what you think is a, an immediate or um, connection or autobiographical relationship to autism, because I hope that one of the things that comes out from this is that we can, if, if autism is indeed spectral, it is us who are in fact autistic for not exploring these different forms of relationality or being that we could be. Um, so really this, 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 has, this applies to all of us. So I, I would love to hear from anyone else as well. The back. Evelyn, so I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with this um, loosely affiliated movement that Evelyn mentioned, object-oriented ontology, um, but very maybe it would be helpful just to give a brief gloss. So what she's referring to is this trend um, towards a trend that's attempting to kind of rethink the terms of philosophy and the terms of um, cultural critique after this kind of massive amount of energy that was expended throughout the 20th century in Western philosophy on the idea that we can't really understand the world or ourselves except in relation to each other. So in other words, all of the Western philosophers that you're familiar with, according to this movement, since Kant down to Derrida, um, have been operating on the premise that the world doesn't really exist except through our capacity to imagine it um, and represent it to ourselves. So in other words, we don't have access to anything out there except through um, the idea of relating to it or relationality. And what, what this group of scholars is trying to do is say, is to try to examine how we can understand objects without the distortion of the idea of relationality. Now it's kind of a, a strange turn because they're actually using rhetoric. It, it's, it's necessarily rhetorical, right? To get outside of rhetoric or using language to get outside of it. But it's an interesting kind of turn in academic thinking. Um, and I think that, the, that where I depart from that that kind of orientation right now is that I think that we need to work with relationality for ethical reasons. And what I see and what I'm kind of moving towards with this research, which I'm kind of moving into a new project as well, is that there seems to be a substantial um, empirical, but also maybe philosophical motivation for thinking about autism as a condition that enables a kind of sonic rather than visual engagement with the world. And the phenomenality of sound is different from vision because vision is directional. It kind of is intentional. You can shut your eyes and shut out visual stimuli, but you can't do that with sound. Um, and sound is also something that resists being fixed in an object. You can't really talk about a sonic object the way you can a visual object because the moment you fix, sound can't be fixed, it has to be just be repeated in an endless loop in order to be fixed. And so this, this so I think that, that that's the kind of way in which I've been kind of engaging with that relationality question that I think is implied by the object-oriented question. But I think what's really interesting about it is that it gets us to move away from the human as the center of the universe and as a certain, 
whenever we say the human is always a particular type of the human, um, usually white, Western, um, oriented by a particular organization of the senses. So um, I think that it's really, there's definitely an interesting movement away from all of those things which we need to, I think, embrace and think with. Thank you, Evelyn. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. And I just want to clarify that this, that the kind of turn that I made by saying we're all autistics is complicated by the spectral condition of autism, actually, because it's not, I, I wasn't saying that in the same way as the kind of move that we see in progressive politics, for instance, of saying I am Trayvon Martin. Not at all. In fact, what I'm suggesting is that it's not autistics who are autistic, it's us who are everything we believe autistics are. It's we and the humanity we inhabit that is confining, excluded, problematic, and limited, and not them. But the problems arise because it's, it's we who inhabit the norm, who set the standards for and the banisters and handrails of the society in which those who we label as autistics have to operate. Um, so that's just one thing I want to clarify. Um, and, but the spectral condition and the spectral diagnosis is actually a kind of problematic one that I think we need to deal with. The incidence of autism has, has increased from one in 2000 in the 1970s to one in 100 in our current moment, partly because the diagnostic category has expanded to incorporate a vast array of conditions that would not have been labeled as such. So I think we need to contend with the discursive categories and not rush to embrace the disability as a lived experience because it might not have been known as a lived experience 30 years ago. That's something that we need to, I think, hold hand in hand with precisely all that is enabled by grasping it as a kind of identitarian category. Um, and then the third thing that you point to is something that I really struggle with and that I'm really trying to think about um, because we've seen this turn that you mentioned, what's your name? Naima, we've seen this term that Naima mentions in a variety of critical fields, like or critical in a variety of some of our in a, in a number of our most heralded philosophers, right? Like Deleuze and Guattari turn to the schizophrenic for a kind of politics of liberation, um, and I think that it's very and and I think that that's happening in animal studies as well. This kind of turn to the animal to think of a kind of non-anthropocentric relationship to the world. And it is very true that something real gets turned into a metaphor. But I think that where I'm at right now is that thinking through autistic accounts of 
communication and relationality for me reveals what is at stake in the kinds of ethical um, kind of the, the contemporary cultural calls for different forms of ethics, such as those that we see in Jean-Luc Nancy, for instance. It actually helps me to see what it would mean to inhabit that kind of ethics and the sheer difficulty of it, which often would mean being autistic or being schizophrenic. Um, but it also, I mean, at the same time, it's a kind of question for politics, right? Like, it's a receding horizon or goal to work, work toward, which is to say, what would it mean to pursue this kind of ethics, even if it would make life unbearable? <laughs> because I think that's really the, the political question. So how to turn a metaphor into a kind of real political agenda while knowing that it's going to take us somewhere that could be really hard. But if we work towards changing the conditions of the social sphere that we inhabit, maybe it would not be so unbearable to occupy the very lived experience of those who we take as metaphors, if, you, if that makes sense. Sorry for that very long-winded answer to your question, but it was such a good question. Um, yes? When you were talking about the differences in the voiceovers between in my own language and often in the world, blah, 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 um, you very briefly mentioned in talking about that difference how the, in, in my own language, the sort of robotic voice was used as opposed to getting a human to read those words was ungendered. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so that the voice which you ultimately hear in that little clip that I played from in my language, I don't believe I don't think I said ungendered, but it's not a normatively gendered female voice um, because it's monotonous. It's almost like auto tune. You know, that's that's the way that it comes out. So it refuses all of the trappings of femininity that come which are evoked by a voice like Juliana Margulies's. And I think Juliana Margulies was such a compelling choice for the voiceover in Autism as a World because I don't think I've ever heard a voice like hers which it just drips empathy. <laughs> and um, whenever I watch The Good Wife, I'm really compelled by her voice. I don't think this is I don't think this is a tangent. I think it's actually <laughs> significant to this because um, the whole kind of discourse of that show is to construct her as this kind of desirable but yet maternal figure. And I think so much of that modulation is achieved by her voice. Um, her voice tells you what kind of a person she is. It's a kind of ethical work that her voice seems to accomplish, which is also a very restrained femininity. So I guess I was trying to, through a word which was not adequate, a gesture toward the way in which the voiceover um, that Amanda Bags uses um, really <coughs> gives us a very strange, or evokes a very strange cyborgian femininity that is, that is not. <laughs> the one that Juliana Margulies' voice indexes, if that makes sense. But I'm trying to think if there's a follow-up to your question or an aspect of it I didn't, that I didn't address. Um, but it's about the physicality or the materiality of the voice and all the unconscious information it conveys without being explicit. Um, and I think some of the conversations around radio that have been happening ever since Serial acquired its massive popularity have been really fascinating. 
which have to do with all of the ways in which we unconsciously discount female voices when they end with a question or when they seem to kind of and just kind of slip away and it's called vocal fry um, and so that this is these are questions that I'm really interested in about what voices convey even though they might not be explicitly conveying I guess Last question. Yes. Um, this is sort of on a different note, I guess, but I feel like in a lot of documentary films that I've seen more recently, there's a lot of silence and there's a lot of the absence of voice. And I know you sort of offer a different way of thinking about voice that makes a lot of sense to me. But there's a sort of like experiential kind of filmmaking where it's this silent gaze, potentially. Sometimes it's like reflective or maybe not reflective, but I wonder if like giving a presence, is that a phrase that you, you could humor or something? <laughs> Does that make sense? Kind yeah, of what absolutely. I'm asking? I mean like what you're also saying is that what you're saying is that voice operates metaphorically whether or not we want it to. And in some of the films that you're, I think, gesturing toward, I think what you're thinking about is the kind of turn that we're seeing more and more in documentary films to a kind of observational, very slow, meditative, um, just lingering, a lingering camera frame. Um, and I think that Actually, the question that you raise is an interesting one, which is, can there be a way of presencing that isn't vocal? And I think there can be, but I think we also need to think about the ways in which what we see often is a stand-in for what we would normatively hear. Um, so for instance, in a film, in the kinds of films that you mentioned, um, if a lingering on the human face or a hand or any variety of things that connote humanity might achieve the same kind of work as a speaking voice. So I think we, we might want to be kind of nuanced when thinking about um, a, what a kind of visual language of presencing would require if it was to get away from the visual repertoire of humanist tropes of humanity and subjectivity and interiority, right, at the same time. Um, but, but I'm glad you mentioned that because I think what we're seeing more and more is a recycling, of, but a, a kind of interesting return of older forms of thinking. Observational cinema had this kind of moment in the 1960s and it was superseded by kind of participatory interactive documentaries. And now we're sick of the voice and we're coming back to these kinds of slow visual meditations, um, just as we're coming back around after the critique of, of a kind of objective way of looking at the world back to an object-oriented ontology. So interesting times and um, but thank you for such great questions and comments and being such a generous audience. I appreciate it.